Insulin allows the uptake of carbohydrates, but it also triggers the storage of fat. And that can become a huge issue. And I remember when I was following a normal standard American diet, and that's something that I see with many of my patients that I see for weight loss, um, you know, you have usually time in the morning where you're pretty good, you have your oatmeal or something that's fairly healthy, have a sensible lunch in the afternoon, at least for me, everything just fell apart. And once I opened a bag of potato chips, ate that whole thing, ate some chocolate and whatever else I found, it was just out of control. There was not enough food and I just kept eating and eating and eating. And then of course felt lousy after for, for multiple reasons, you know, and it's just really horrible. And so this is something that, you know, happens when you have early uh, insulin resistance. And that's what I had. My hemoglobin A1C about five years ago, before I changed my diet and, and my exercise pattern and everything, was about 5.8. And uh, the issue is if we spike insulin all the time, at some point we will develop insulin resistance, you know, and that can lead to type 2 diabetes in, in more extreme cases if this uh, goes further. So the problem is I always thought, well, look, if you're younger, eat whatever you want, you know, enjoy your carbohydrates. And, you know, when I was younger, I never put on fat. It was easy for me. I could eat whatever I wanted to. And um, I find, though, that we should be controlling it even at a younger age. And I'm very on top of it now, especially with my children, that they don't eat so much junk when they're, you know, now, now they're still very young because it does set you up later to develop insulin resistance. This doesn't happen overnight. This is something that builds up over time. And uh, the issue is if we spike insulin all the time, so we snack between meals, we eat meals that are very rich in carbohydrates, we take in uh, on a normal day in way too many carbohydrates, and then we eat, uh, we finish eating late and we start eating early. So there's not enough time even overnight uh, to give our, our pancreas a significant break to stop secreting insulin. So we're secreting insulin all the time and we at some point become resistant to it. That means we have to secrete more and more and more and more to get the effect of being able to take up carbohydrates. And that becomes a big issue because again, the second function of insulin is the storage of fat. And that is something that, you know, you would see in most people that have weight issues, there's early insulin sensitivity. They might have early type two diabetes already, and there's a, a multiple host of, um, of health issues related to this. So one thing I I that's important to understand is we, there are certain measures we can take to decrease our insulin sensitivity and decrease these constant high spikes of insulin and that can be very helpful and you know fairly easy to incorporate and then we feel better because one thing that was a big change for me is when I, I, I went on a ketogenic diet I did that consistently at least for one year maybe actually a bit longer and I'm still on a ketogenic diet today however I do strategically incorporate carbohydrates in between which I believe is a good thing to do People vary about this, you know, you have the extreme, some people go even on a carnivore diet, they go very, very, very low carb and, and only eat animal products. Some people are more lenient. So for me, um, you know, the ketogenic diet was really super helpful in that all these cravings stopped. I wasn't hungry anymore. I had to remind myself almost to eat in between. And I thought that was fantastic. You know, that was really an interesting thing. But I want to talk a bit, you know, you don't have to go to the extreme about going on a ketogenic diet because that actually uh, requires, you know, a bit of really research into, you know, what you can eat, what you shouldn't eat, you know, how you should mix your foods and there's a lot of mistakes to be made. But even changing to a low carb diet and implementing some of these changes, you can significantly decrease these, these insulin spikes. Okay. So number one to lower your insulin is timed eating. And that's, um, for example, you say, hey, I'm going to eat about three to four meals every day. And then you allow time between your meals. So you have the meals a fairly good size. One thing I observe in most of the people that, um, you know, that I see for, uh, for losing weight or friends of mine even that have issues with their weight is that they're eating pretty small portions. Like you go out to them to eat and like you're surprised because the portion is fairly small and sensible. I mean, it's good foods. Um, and you say, wow, if they're eating like this all the time, how come they have such weight issues? But then a lot of times, you know, between foods, they keep snacking, they keep eating, you know, and uh, this is something that's really hard to control and it's hard to calculate how much calories actually come in this way, right? So timed eating means eating decent sized portions about three to four times a day and then allowing at least three to four hours between your meals. So for me, usually on a normal day, I would eat about 10, two and six, let's say. I might have a snack or a protein shake somewhere in between. Sometimes I add the protein shake to my lunch. And um, the advantage is, you know, when you're working out and sometimes, you know, some people believe protein is 
you know, okay to take in in terms of like a, like a shake or an extra supplement to get the right amount of protein you need. You don't have to space that out too much. The body is pretty good at taking a large amounts of protein and then, you know, using it throughout the day. So you don't have to worry so much about it. The advantage of adding the shake to the meal makes the meal a bit bigger and then you have a longer time between the next meal. So that allows your insulin to come down again, which is very, very important. So timed eating, very important. Then the food composition. So like I mentioned before, good volume. What does that mean? You want that, uh, uh, you know, each meal to be a decent size that you're really full. A mistake I see is again, people having these tiny meals and then right away, half hour later, they're hungry again and then they keep snacking. And I think that's a mistake. I'd rather people eat a decent amount of food um, in, uh, in one meal and uh, that you're pretty full. You can control the composition of the food and then you allow three to four hours between your meals. Okay, that's very important. So good volume, very important. Have a good amount of protein in there, you know. Um, good protein can come from eggs, it can come from, uh, um, you know, meat, but it can certainly come from other sources as well. So if you're vegan, vegan or vegetarian, pea protein is something that some people tolerate very well. I'm not big on soy protein because of the hormonal issues with it, but there's other sources of protein that are certainly very good. Then of course, fat, don't be, don't be afraid of fat. I think that's a huge mistake. Be afraid of bad fats. And I keep saying this, I did a lot of uh, videos about, about fats. I keep mentioning the same ones just for simplicity reasons. You know, there's you know, avocado oil, coconut oil, olive oil, and butter. And these are fine to use. All those vegetable oils and polyunsaturated uh, vegetables, don't, don't use those, those are really bad. So good fats, it's good proteins, good fats. And then keep the carbohydrate content low. So I wouldn't have the pasta or the rice necessarily. And certainly I would cut out anything that you know, has gluten, uh, you know, as a general rule. Again, not because suddenly everybody's, you know, has celiac disease, that's not correct. But gluten is very inflammatory and it causes a leaky gut, it causes, you know, bloating, it causes a lot of issues that are just not very good. So I would just cut gluten out. By virtue of cutting gluten out, you're already lowering your carbohydrate content significantly. So that's one easy thing to do that's good for you and it lowers the carbohydrate content, right? Um, then, very important, if you can, no food three to four hours before bed and no food three to four hours after you get up. That means really no calories. And I did a video about intermittent fasting. So the key thing to understand is that anything that has calories will stop you from fasting. And fasting just means that time from between the last meal, between the dinner and between the first time you consume any calories. So for a long time, I made the mistake that I put creamer in my coffee in the morning. I get up early, I get up at like 4.30, 5 o'clock and I put creamer in my coffee and that stops the fast because there's fat in there. There was no sugar in there, you know, it was one with some, you know, uh, stevia, I think. But, you know, it doesn't matter where the calories come from, any calories will briefly, even so slightly, spike your insulin. And when that happens, you stop fasting, you stop burning fat. So again, and we also wanna stop insulin spikes altogether, you know, through a significant period of time overnight. So three to four hours before you go to bed, no more food, and then in the morning, wait three to four hours before you eat. Start out with a big glass of water, coffee, tea, any amount you want. Don't put anything in it, no sweetener, no, no nothing. You know, just you know, black coffee, espresso, tea, water, as much as you want, of course, hydration is very important. And then have your first meal, you know, about three to four hours after you get up. And the first meal, again, don't make it too heavy on the carbs, you know, you know keep it low carb. So I always give an example. For me, a normal breakfast could be a, a Greek yogurt with some blueberries and some pecans and macadamias, or a couple of eggs and avocado, something like that. You know, that's fairly low on the carbohydrate side. You don't want to go too heavy on the fat in the morning either, but you know, like keep it like a like a like a healthy healthy breakfast in that in that sense. Okay. Um, no fruit, and that's one thing, uh, especially when we think about spiking insulin. Now, fruit mostly has fructose as its sugar. It's true that fructose doesn't spike insulin too much. The issue with fructose is it's not very usable, uh, you know, and we take it up a bit differently. So fructose pretty much goes straight to the liver, gets, it can be stored as glycogen in, in, in the liver, can be converted to glycogen. However, that's a very small storage in the liver and then most of it will go and get stored as fat. So fruit, so fructose, unfortunately, uh, can lead to significant amount of fat storage, especially visceral fat. And then again, when we have a lot of visceral fat, insulin resistance goes up even more. It's a very vicious cycle. And we start feeling lousy, we get, you know, uh, possibly early type two diabetes. This is a horrible situation. So fruit in moderation is okay. Um, 
If you have weight issues though, I recommend stick to probably raspberry and uh, raspberries, blueberries, any, any berries should be okay. Make sure it's organic. I did a very short video about that. Uh, organic means no pesticides and no fertilizers because you know, when you think of blueberries, you can't wash these very well. So you will probably consume whatever, you know, comes in there from those chemicals and certainly don't want that. But you know, like a half a cup on, if you're keto, I would probably go with a quarter cup a day, like a small amount, you know. Uh, raspberries and blueberries that should be fine but everything else from from apples bananas and all those things i would kind of cut out because it is a lot of sugar or eat very very small amounts of it right and then you know also no juices or smoothies because i see the mistake a lot of time people get these green juices and the only reason they taste good is because they put a bunch of fruit in there and that's really you know counterproductive so these are some simple steps to help you know decrease uh, these insulin fluctuations and the important thing to understand really is it's, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of hormones that are involved in your appetite and hunger. There's the ghrelin and leptin, and there's many videos about this. And I think it's important to understand all these mechanisms. But I mean, for simplicity, when you, when you, when you think about it, what we can control is really the fluctuations of insulin. And part of that is decreasing our carbohydrate intake, eating healthier fats, and having good fats and protein with each meal, which keeps us full. Um, and then, you know, having s space between your meals. That's a very, very important thing that, that helps a lot. If you have severe insulin resistance and, you know, you can talk to your physician and of course, any change you make, especially if you have any medical condition, you should discuss this with your physician. I can't give medical advice, you know, via a video because I don't know any of your conditions, but it is a possibility and it worked for many of my patients and worked for me to briefly at least go on a ketogenic diet to really, really get away from these cravings altogether. And that to me, I think was the most successful thing that I found that, you know, I don't have these cravings. Now I can really control what I'm eating a lot better. And even though I'm eating some carbohydrates now, strategically sometimes in the morning, I will have like three, four uh, days a week, I'll have a bit of oatmeal uh, with a bit of blueberries and something. That is okay because I don't have the cravings throughout the day. Um, so having at least, you know, these few weeks of being on a strict ketogenic diet has helped for me and for many of my patients tremendously to get, of these, to get rid of these cravings. Again, that's not advice, but that's something maybe to consider with you and your uh, healthcare provider.